She is she's the lead veterinarian at Liberty Wildlife. Uh, she's been she specializes in avian and exotic animal medicine. She's going to discuss the impact of the highly pathogenic avian flu on the California condors. Uh, she's had a very interesting experience with one of those one of those condors, and uh, she's going to share all that with us tonight. So, without further ado, Dr. Lamb, take it away. We'll share right. the screen for you. All right. Thank you so much. I am happy to come and talk to you guys. Um, so, this is actually my first time getting to do any. Uh, uh, public speaking about this event with the with the California condors. Um, so it's it's kind of exciting. Um, I have a couple of other talks lined up at a couple of other like conferences. So you guys are my first ones who get to hear about this, uh, this uh, issue with the California condors. So you guys can let me know uh, what you think at the end. <laughs> yeah, great. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen because I do have a PowerPoint to show you guys um to go through everything so let me get that up here and okay okay great and minimize that all right so um talking to you guys tonight about highly pathogenic avian influenza in the california condor population uh, but before I get into the real specifics of what happened here in Arizona with the California condors, um, I just wanted to give you guys a bit of background on uh, high pathogenic avian influenza. Because, you know, it's good to understand what the virus is, um, what we're dealing with to get a better idea of, you know, how it really impacts these animals that are out there. So um, influenza viruses are infectious viral diseases, and they encompass a number of different strains of influenza. They all belong to a group called the Orthomyxoviridae family, and there's three genera in that Orthomyxidae family. There's influenza A, influenza B, and influenza C, and I'm sure you guys have heard those before. Um, birds will get a variety of influenza A viruses. Now, the name of the virus does actually tell us quite a bit about what particular influenza it is. Um, they are always followed by uh, a letter H and the letter N, and the H and the N have a number after it. Um, and what are these things? Well, these represent surface proteins that are on the virus. So for example, this particular virus that we were dealing with is H5N1. Um, There's just a little cartoon picture of it. The H stands for a hemagglutinin protein that's on the surface of that virus. And there's about 18 different subtypes of that H hemagglutinin protein. And so because there's 18 different subtypes, um, we will, you know, label them which would what which uh whatever one it is so like again this particular one that we're dealing with is h5 um and what that hemagglutinin protein does is it allows the virus to attach to the host cell and it binds a specific receptor on the host cell it will neutralize the host antibodies and it allows that um virus to then enter into the host cell now the other protein is uh, N, and it stands for neuraminidase, or N stands for neuraminidase protein. There's 11 different subtypes of that. That particular one is important for um, catalyzing the breakdown of virus particles um, from those uh, acid sites where it attaches to, to allow the virus to spread within the host. So one of them allows it to attach to the host, the other one allows it to unattach to the host so it can kind of move around and move to different parts of the body. So again, there's because there's so many different types of those proteins, they are named for whatever uh, subtype it is they have on the surface of the virus. So examples, you know, H1N1, H7N3, could be H16N2. I mean, there's, you know, quite a variety, given how many uh, subtypes there are. Um, 
The important thing about that is the combination of the H and the N protein subtype on the surface of the virus actually will dictate how pathogenic it is. Because you'll also hear with influenzas, there's low pathogenicity influenza, and then there's high pathogenicity influenza. And low pathogenicity means that there's going to be maybe no signs of problems whatsoever. An animal could potentially harbor this virus, have it replicating in them, um, and even spreading it to others, but they have zero signs. Or they may just have mild disease. Um, and so in uh, like a chicken, for example, this picture here is a couple of chickens. Um, in a chicken that may have the low pathogenicity version, mild disease may manifest as like a little bit of nasal discharge. It may be something so insignificant that it may go unnoticed. Um, on the other hand, the high pathogenicity one, these ones can cause moderate to even severe disease with sometimes up to 100% mortality. So, uh, you know, that means 100% death. Uh, the types that are typically high pathogenic are H1, H5, and H7. Um, those are those are the big bad ones. So if we hear that there is a uh, influenza virus circulating that's any of those, it's H1, H5, H7, we start to pay attention as, as veterinarians or healthcare professionals um, because those are the ones that are more likely to be serious versus if we hear, oh yeah, there was a case of avian influenza, but it was, you know, H4 something that it's kind of like, well, that one isn't so big of a deal. Um, we don't need to worry as much. It's unlikely to really cause a big problem. Now it's important to know um, as well, that when we talk about how pathogenic these are, we're actually talking mostly about how pathogenic they are in chickens specifically. Um, so H5 and H7 uh, influenza viruses are, are most problematic in the chicken. Um, so it's, it's, something to keep in mind because you may hear, oh my gosh, it's high pathogenic influenza, it's H5, whatever. Um, but just because it's highly pathogenic in the chicken doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be horrible for every other bird that it gets into. Okay, there's even more to their names. So I, I, I bring this up more because I want you guys to understand that you may hear this in so many different ways um, and they can all be talking about the exact same thing. So the other way that you will hear influenza virus is named is this very long name that includes the genera, the species that it's affecting, um, the location where it was first identified, the isolate number, the year it came out, and then the serotype. So for example, at the bottom there, you'll see this A slash equine slash Saskatoon and the number. So A, it's the influenza A uh, genera. The first species it was uh, affected in was the horse. Um, it was I first identified in Saskatoon. It's the isolate number one. It was the first one of this type. Um, it emerged in 1990. And then the stereotype is H3 and H. So that's just an example of something you might see. So if you see this really long name after uh, influenza, then you get an idea a little bit more about that specific influenza that was causing a problem. So what do we call this current outbreak that we're dealing with? <clears throat> well, you may hear it called highly pathogenic avian influenza, high pathogenicity avian influenza, HPAI for short, that one's kind of nice to say, H5N1, um, or the very long name, A avian Eurasian lineage goose, uh, Guangdong H5 clad, 2.3.4.4b. That's really long and nobody really wants to have to say that. So you're going to see that written. You're not going to hear anybody say that ever. Most likely people are going to be saying H5N1 or HPAI. So those are all the different things you may hear this virus called by. Um, so don't get confused if, if uh, you hear it by one over the other. We're really talking about the same thing. Okay, a little bit more about the virus. Um, there's DNA viruses, there's RNA viruses, high pathogenic avian influenza, it's an RNA virus. 
Uh, it contains six segments of RNA and it codes for 10 viral proteins. So just a little bit of uh, fun science knowledge for you guys. It's an envelope virus. And the reason this is important is because envelope viruses tend to be less stable outside of the host, um, which can be used to our or we can use it sort of to our benefit because influenza viruses prefer temperatures below 70 uh, degrees. Um, that's just a Fahrenheit, not Celsius. I'm catching that right now. It's temperatures below 70 degrees Fahrenheit. And then they also prefer a moist environment. So right now um, where our temperatures are not even getting you know, down into the seventies whatsoever um, and it's you know a bit dry, this we're not really having a lot of problems right now because the virus is not liking to survive outside of the host right now to so kind of maintain in the population very well. But when we come to, you know, cooler temperatures um, and time when it's not as dry um, and there's more moisture around, that's when we are likely to be seeing problems from this again. Um, with shedding of the virus, the virus is shed in respiratory secretions and also in the feces. So like when one animal has this virus, it is going to either, you know, uh, have secretions like uh, from the nostrils or like coughing up um, stuff from the respiratory tract itself um, and could spread the virus that way or passing in the stool. And it actually survives longer in the stool um, than it does when it is excreted from respiratory secretions. And animals will contract this from others um, by the oral route. So they, they have to um, ingest it or inhale it in some way. It can actually be aerosolized up to three feet away. Um, so, you know, that is problematic um, because if you're in a room with an animal that has this, um, you know, if you're within three feet of them and that animal sneezes, coughs, um, or dry fecal matter gets aerosolized in some way, um, you could potentially be coming in contact with it. And it can be spread on fomites. And what fomites are, are inanimate, un, you know, un, non-living objects that it can attach itself to and spread from one place to another. So that's gonna be things like our clothing, um, shoes, uh, papers, pens, you know, objects that the, the virus got onto and then gets transferred somewhere else. Uh, when it comes to the hosts for the virus, there's natural hosts and there's aberrant hosts. So natural hosts is what the virus usually likes to hang it out in, the species that it wants to stay in and that it will often circulate in and cause minimal signs in those species. So for um, the current virus that we're dealing with with high pathogenic influenza and most of our influenzas in, in avians, it likes to stay in waterfowl and shorebirds. So ducks, geese, swans, um, storks, plover, sandpipers, gulls, all those guys can carry it, but not always have problems from it. And I mean, some of them will, there are some species that are more likely to show signs, even of those waterfowl and shorebirds that are the natural hosts, um, but there's lots of them that don't. And so that can be uh, difficult because you may have a duck that um, has the virus and is acting totally fine. It could potentially be around a host that doesn't normally get the virus and spread it to them and, and cause pretty severe disease. Those aberrant hosts are the ones that the um, virus is not normally in. And so uh, these are the ones where they have a greater potential to cause severe signs. So poultry, raptors, humans, <clears throat> other mammals, those are um, hosts that the avian influenza virus is less likely to be present in. And so when it gets into them, it causes a lot more problems for them. So um, the signs uh, do vary based on if we're talking about those low pathogenic or high pathogenic variants. So in the low pathogenic variants, again, sometimes it's asymptomatic and that can be common in wild birds that they may have influenza virus, but act totally fine and have no problems. In chickens, when they get it, it can cause coughing, sneezing, rails. What rails are is it's just um, kind of the bird term for like a gurgly sort of sound because um, of fluid in the trachea. 
uh, rattles, which is also just sort of the bird version of uh, when like we listen to the chest and you hear harshness in there. Uh, they can have eye discharge. They can have gastrointestinal signs like diarrhea. They may have effects on the reproductive tract. They might not really produce eggs as, as much as they're supposed to. And then they may just kind of have general signs of a bird that doesn't look healthy. It's ruffling its feathers. It's acting depressed. It's huddled. It's not really eating as well. It just looks sick. Um, but again, the low pathogenic even influenza viruses are lower mortality versus the high pathogenic uh, avian influenza viruses, they cause moderate to severe symptoms. So some birds just suddenly die. Um, it's just acute death. They may be acting totally fine and then they're found dead. They may show general signs of depression or anorexia. And you know, those aren't very specific to influenza at all, right? Like lots of different things could potentially make a bird feel depressed or act depressed or um, not really want to eat. Um, so it's really sometimes difficult to tell, okay, well, if a bird is eating, isn't eating, what is it that's causing this symptom? It can cause neurologic disease. And this really has been the, the biggest thing that um, with this current strain of hypothogenic avian influenza, that's been an outbreak in the um, raptors. The biggest thing that people have been looking for is neurologic signs. So they may have paresis, meaning they really can't use their limbs well. They have the ability to move them, but they don't really have the ability to walk or grasp or perch like they should. Or they may be completely paralyzed, but they have no ability to use those feet whatsoever, or even seizure activity. Um, and that can be, you know, pretty sad to, to watch. Um, they can also have respiratory signs. So they may come in again with those uh, harsh, gurgly sort of sounds in their throat. They may be sneezing, they may be coughing, um, or they can even just have GI signs of hemorrhaging uh, from the, the GI tract and having just bloody diarrhea. Um, and again, some of them just ac acutely die or die uh, not too long after they start to show some of these signs. Um, so for the morbidity and mortality, it really is based on the strain, the environment conditions, the age of the bird that we're talking about who got the virus, and also if there's any concurrent infections, because sometimes, you know, these viruses, they suppress the immune system, and maybe there's something else that the bird has been managing and not having much of a problem with, but now that the body is really focused on um, dealing with this influenza infection, now an other underlying virus or parasitic problem or bacterial infection is now able to no longer be kept in check and start to cause problems as well. For that low pathogenic influenza, um, it's usually high morbidity and morbidity meaning disease, but low mortality meaning death. So mortality is often less than 5%. It could be a little bit higher than that in young animals because you know young animals don't have a great immune system, so they may not be as adept at fighting things off. Versus the high pathogenic influenza, it has a high morbidity and mortality. The mortality averages around 50 to 80%. But again, like I mentioned earlier, sometimes it can cause up to 100% mortality. So it really can be quite devastating um, in certain scenarios how the disease progresses. Um, and this is based off of initially, I have at the top here, uh, poultry. Um, but in poultry, if it's birds that are housed on the floor, then they will have peak mortality in three to five days of a virus coming into a facility versus if they're housed in cages, they actually have a peak mortality 10 to 15 days after it comes into a facility. And if you remember when I was saying, well, how does it actually get transmitted? And that's through respiratory and fecal uh, secretions. And it actually does better in, when it's transmitted through the feces. If birds are housed on the floor, what are they in contact with? They are in contact with feces. If they're walking all around feces um, and pecking on the ground next to feces, it's easy for them to get the virus versus if they're, uh, again, poultry housed in cage um, and they're up off the ground, they don't have as much contact with the feces. So now we're relying a lot more on the respiratory secretions uh, for it to be passed around. Thus, it takes longer for it to move through facilities. Um, now, if it's wild birds that we're talking about, the progression of the disease is highly variable. Um, and that's going to depend on the species that we're talking about. Um, and also, really, there, there is a seasonality to this virus. Um, and 
our seasonality is a little bit in Arizona here is a little bit different than some other parts of the country. Um, so when this strain of high path avian influenza first started peaking up and, and being a, a problem, you know, in the Midwest, it was really being a problem in the summer months. But in the Midwest, in the summer months, as we know, it's quite different from here. There's a lot more moisture um, and the temperatures are not as hot here um, in certain areas, you know. So they were having uh, their peak mortality in the summer, like spring, summer versus here, we were having problems um, in, in March. So a little bit of information on our current outbreak. This information is updated as of yesterday. Um, you can go to the USDA APHIS website um, and actually follow the changes with this virus, uh, what it's doing across the country, how many birds are affected. So I, I uh, looked into it yesterday to see where we were. And in wild birds, there's greater than 7,000 reported cases. Um, in Arizona, we've had 52 cases reported. In Minnesota, uh, they have the highest number and they're at 608 cases reported. And that's wild bird specific. And then, you know, you can go on and you can look at any, any I state that you want to see um, and get information about how many cases they have reported. Um, and it's important to note that what's reported in the wild birds is only likely a small representation of what's actually out there, right? Because these are birds that people have picked up or have come into rehabilitation facilities and been and been able to be tested. There's, I'm sure, plenty of birds out there who have died, who, you know, people aren't finding or are getting scavenged um, by other animals. And so these numbers are actually probably quite a bit higher than what we actually know. Um, in the poultry, uh, there's quite a bit more. Um, so there's over 58 million individual birds that have been affected by this current outbreak. Um, and I have the numbers there for the different types of flocks, uh, commercial versus backyard flocks. There's certainly much more backyard flocks that are affected than commercial flocks. Um, and part of that is going to be because, well, you know, backyard flocks uh, are owned by, you know, us regular people, um, where maybe we aren't doing as much really intense biosecurity as uh, poultry facilities are. Um, and then there's lots of mammals that have actually been affected by this particular outbreak as well. Um, there's approximately 190 cases. I have them listed there of the different species that have been affected, the mountain lion, bobcats, brown bear, black bear, bottlenose dolphin, gray seals, harbor seals, Red fox, coyote, fishers, American martins, North American river otters, raccoons, skunks, and the Virginia possum. And then in humans, um, the, the previous H5N1 strains uh, that were reported, because these strains of influenza, they go through cycles, you know? So like, okay, right now we're dealing with H5N1, but we have, it has been out there before in the world. Um, and the amount of cases that have happened in humans between January of uh, 2003 to April of 2023 was 874 cases of people reported in the world. Of those, 53% are fatal. So if people get this, it's a high fatality rate. Um, the current strain that we have going around, there's only been 10 cases reported, one of which was in the U.S. I do see there's a question up in the chat, so I can go ahead and look at that really quick and answer. Oh, great. Somebody went ahead and gave us the information for, uh, where you can look up the, um, APHIS website. So yeah, definitely look into that if you're interested, because it'll, it'll keep you up to date with, um, what's going on. Okay. All right. So now to get more specifically into what happened here in Arizona. Um, so beginning in March of 2023, uh, the California calendars that are out there in the wild that are being monitored um, specifically in Arizona, because there's monitoring of the California condors in a few different states where they're in, you know, here in Arizona, um, Utah, um, 
Oregon and in California, but the ones in Arizona started to act a little bit odd. The birds were sitting around more. They weren't moving as much as they normally would and not really engaging in normal activities. Um, and then unfortunately, some birds started passing away. So um, when this started happening, the biologists are out there monitoring them, doing a fabulous job of keeping track of the health of these individuals. Um, and they were able to go out and collect this first individual. We're just going to call her case one. Um, so she was collected on March 16th um, in the Grand Canyon. And the things that they noticed with her was just that she was thin. She wasn't eating great. Um, she was lethargic. And she had what's called corneal edema. And so if you look at this picture of her, uh, her eye here, you can notice this sort of blue hazy sort of appearance on the surface of the eye itself that's corneal edema so that's fluid that's actually building up in the cornea and making it have this hazy appearance that's actually something that is um, a sign that has been associated with high pathogenic h5n1 avian influenza in different species of birds so if we're seeing that, that starts to make us worried that, okay, um, we might have this influenza on our hands. So they collected her and got her into Liberty Wildlife, um, uh, you know, within 24 hours of, of getting her. Um, she was tested for high pathogenic influenza, um, but when she first came down, we didn't have the appropriate like media that was necessary to do the test. So they tried to do the test on the media that we did have available to us um, on a couple different dates, but the lab said they didn't like the media that we had utilized. Um, and so they wouldn't, they weren't able to run the test because we're testing for a very important uh virus, like the the lab's criteria are very strict for what they will, um, how they allow testing to come in on, on what media and all that sort of stuff. So uh, we had to wait to get the appropriate stuff that we needed to actually do the test. But by the time that we got the appropriate media to um, do the test uh, with what the lab wanted, uh, we were now at March 29th. And at this time, when we swabbed her, then she actually came up negative for the virus. So those first two times we tested her, um, she probably was positive, but we can't say that because we don't actually have the lab's confirmation of it because they wouldn't actually run the test. Um, but it looked, you know, very, so she looked suspicious for the virus. And interestingly, the day that we were able to do the swab of, on the appropriate media, that was the same day that that corneal edema on her eye resolved. So she was actually starting to make improvements by the time we actually got to do the test. So she had signs of this virus for actually 13 days, um, which is kind of a long period of time. As, uh, so um, that was sort of interesting. And we were able to later on do serology with her, which is where we are testing her for antibodies to see if she had the virus or not to see if her body was exposed to the virus, did it make appropriate antibodies to this virus, and now she has some level of protection. And in fact, when we did that test, we found that yes, she actually did have antibodies to the virus. Um, and she has sort of persisted with her antibodies to that virus. So yes, she was um, an individual who had the virus, we just weren't able to actually get the confirmation um, because of the issues with initially swabbing her. There is going to be a little bit of information in here that I'm just going to briefly touch over um, that is really more for if you're interested, but I'm not going to go through it in every case, just to give you an idea of what else we did with these birds while they were in, in Liberty Wildlife and how we were caring for them. So all the birds that came in, um, they did get subcutaneous fluids, so fluids underneath the skin, and they got these every 12 hours until they were either no longer um, dehydrated or they were starting to eat on their own because some of these birds were coming in just, you know, not wanting to eat, um, and we needed to keep them uh, 
hydrated well during these times because if they're not eating, they're also not drinking um, and they can become dehydrated easily. And when you're dehydrated, you often don't feel great. It makes them feel uh, more crummy um, and also isn't very good for the body. So we needed to support them with fluid therapy. We also did anti-inflammatory therapy for them as well because the anti-inflammatories were meant to try to stop that uh, inflammatory process that's going on in the body of the body trying to combat the virus, but also the, all the damage that the virus is doing is inducing a lot of inflammation. And inflammation is good to a certain level, but too much is not so good. So we were trying to stop that from being too excessive. The problem with condors is they're a vulture. And vultures are known to be a little bit more sensitive to certain anti-inflammatories. Uh, studies are showing that this particular one we used, meloxicam seems to be the safe one for use in them. Um, however, we still have to be somewhat cautious. And especially since we're working with an endangered species, the last thing we want to do is cause harm, right? So um, they only got one injection of this anti-inflammatory so that we're trying to like head off the inflammation that the virus is causing, but also not do damage ourselves. We also did um, vitamin B complex because vitamin B complex is just a great sort of supportive care that we can do. Um, it helps uh, stimulate their appetite as well. So we did that for a few days into her stay until she really started to want to eat on her own. We did several additional tests as well, and I list them out here. Um, so that you can kind of see there was there was a lot of stuff that was done with these birds. We were looking at regular red cell counts, white cell count. We were doing what's called a biochemistry profile where we're looking at how the organs are functioning, what's their liver function, their kidney function, um, what are their electrolytes, what are their fat levels. We're doing what's called a protein electrophoresis that's looking at um, their protein levels and we're seeing what the inflammatory response is to this virus. We're also testing them for other known diseases. So chlamydia is a um, infectious disease that is out there in lots of different species of birds. So we're testing them for that. We're also testing them for aspergillosis, which is a fungal infection that can happen, uh, particularly in birds that are in a captive setting um, when they're stressed. And so we wanted to make sure that, you know, they're not immunocompromised with other problems. And also that um, while they're staying with us, we're being as uh, cautious as we, we need to be to make sure that these animals are um, staying, you know, healthy or trying to get them to a point of being healthy and not having other diseases um, cause problems. And then because it is just unfortunately the most common thing that California condors die from is lead toxicity, uh, we were testing their lead levels as well because we wanted to make sure if anybody had lead toxicity on top of influenza, we were covering them for treatment with that. We're also testing them for copper um, because that is a, a newer thing that we're looking at in um, California condors specifically to see what their copper levels are um, since the um, plan or and hope is that most people are going to be transitioning over from using uh, lead bullets to copper bullets um, in some states, you know, it's mandated. So um, trying to make sure that, you know, we aren't uh, this copper, these copper bullets that people are going to be using aren't going to be, you know, also causing problems in any way for them. So with this first case, she actually started to improve about five days into her stay. And then her appetite and that corneal edema, that haziness on the eye had resolved with by 13 days. Um, she, we then did a series of uh, follow-up tests to really ensure that she was truly negative. And we tested each bird once they were um, doing better with their clinical science, we tested them um, on a weekly basis. And we tried to get two negative tests before we said, okay, with two negative tests, you're okay to um, move out from these quarantine areas because these birds were being put into a, a quarantine area where the amount of people that were allowed to walk into that quarantine area was very, very, very limited um, because you know we have to worry about not only these birds, but we have to worry about all these other birds in the facility that we're not transferring things to anybody else. And then we also have to worry about all the people who are um, involved with these cases. So it was a very limited number of people who are allowed to interact with the um, birds. And when people were going in, I mean, it was fully gowned up um, with N95 masks and um, appropriate footwear um, and coveralls and things like that so that uh, we were really not tracking anything in and not tracking anything out. 
All right, the second case came in on March 29th. Um, this one, we had the appropriate media at that time, so we were able to test him and was found to be positive. Um, we did try to do serology testing on this one, but unfortunately the sample was not um, really a, a good sample and we weren't able to tell what her titers were. Now she got the same sort of supportive care. She got fluids, she got anti-inflammatories and vitamin B, um, and she got all the same additional testing that that first case did. However, uh, on her additional testing, she was found to have a slight increase in her lead level. I have it written down here. Um, and so she did start chelation therapy and that's what this is, chelated with calcium EGTA. Once we found that her lead level was a little bit high and this actually isn't so bad, condors can sometimes get their lead levels much, much, much higher than this. Um, but because she was above the reference ranges and she wasn't feeling good uh, and she was battling this, this virus, we thought it was important that she um, get the chelation therapy as well. You notice the other thing about her that's different is she got a medication called Tamiflu. Um, I'm sure you guys have heard of Tamiflu. It's something that we, people will take when people get influenza. Um, their doctor may prescribe them Tamiflu um, to help with trying to stop that virus um, from replicating in their system. It works better sort of as a preventative um, or like in the very early stages of someone contracting the virus. Um, we don't really know how it works in the California condor because it's never been used before. Um, but it was something that we thought at the time uh, because we were dealing with this highly pathogenic virus. It was very early in the outbreak and Arizona was the first and so far, and hopefully will be, who knows, uh, is the only state that's had to deal with high pathogenic influenza in, in the condors population. So um, we weren't sure how things were gonna go. So we did go ahead and start her on this um, medication as well. We did collect blood from her to test, see if this uh, medication made any difference. Um, and that testing is still pending. I don't have those results yet. Uh, so this individual, sadly, uh, she was in care for eight days, but she just went downhill. Um, she, after a few days in the hospital uh, at Liberty Wildlife, she started to develop corneal edema. She didn't have it the, when she originally came in, but it started to develop in one eye and then spread to the other. Um, she was really still like mentally alert and fighting, um, but she started to become paritic. So that means she was losing the ability to lose her, use her hind limbs. Um, and she just slowly became weaker and sadly passed away uh, from the virus um, eight days into her stay. The third one that came in to Liberty Wildlife, um, that one actually came in was pretty sad. That one was actually having active seizures when it came into the facility. Um, so when it came into the facility, it did get the same sort of supportive care as the others of fluids and anti-inflammatories, but because it was actively having a seizure, uh, we did give it a medication to stop that seizure. Because she was so debilitated, when she came in and having that seizure, I didn't think it was right or appropriate to collect any blood samples or testing from her at that time. Um, because in that moment when she came in, what I wanted more for her was to get her stable if I could get her stable. And I didn't want to do additional testing and stress her further. Sadly, she did pass away the following morning. Um, so she was sent to um, a lab for testing and was confirmed to have high pathogenic influenza. The fourth case that came in, came in on April 3rd, um, was thin. Uh, we swabbed that individual and um, was positive for influenza virus. Um, and interestingly, this one, uh, throughout the stay with us, we swabbed him a few times and he actually stayed positive for the virus through a few testing times, like of all the individuals that we tested, he stayed positive the longest. Um, and it wasn't until he got his two negative tests that we deemed that, okay, he was okay to leave the quarantine area and go back into more of like the general population area. Uh, we did get to do lots of titers on him and he actually had very high titers, meaning that he had a good antibody response um, to the virus. 
he was treated similar to everybody else. He was also one of the birds that got um, the Tamiflu. Um, one thing that was different about him was he did have a high white cell count. So we were a little worried like, well, um, the others didn't seem to have too high of a white cell count. So was that high white cell count because of the infection? It very well could have been with influenza or was there potentially something else infectious going on? Um, and so we did go ahead and get him some antibiotics as well, just to be making sure we weren't having some secondary bacterial infection that was going to complicate things further for him. Thankfully for him, he did remain stable throughout his stay. He didn't develop any other signs. So he was, he was a success case. Um, the fifth one that came in came in on April 7th. So you can see we were really getting these birds in kind of rapidly. Um, we would be getting calls that, hey, we've got another one. We need to get it down to you guys. So um, we were pretty much on call uh, this whole time, you know, just being prepared and waiting for them to come in. Um, so this individual, um, when she came in, she was also pretty ill. She had, by the time she had gotten in, um, she had gotten in very, very, very late um, in the evening, but unfortunately she had passed away overnight um, before we were able to do any supportive care um, or testing with her. Uh, so in fact, it was kind of, you know, amazing that she even was able to make the ride down to us. Um, she was also sent out for necropsy and she was positive for influenza. The sixth case uh, came in um, on at the same day when that uh, female, uh, case five, had come in. This one was thin, uh, tested positive, um, and really shifted to being negative rather quickly into its day, which was good. And we got those two negative tests. Um, this one, like case four, had a slight increase in its white cells, so it was put on uh, antibiotics as well, but all the other same supportive care. Um, and this one also did remain stable throughout her stay and, and didn't develop any other signs. So after she got those two negative tests, she was able to be moved out um, of the quarantine. Oh. The seventh case came in on April 11th. This one was really thin, had a little spot of petechiation, and that's basically like a little blood spot, essentially like on the eyelid. There was also some trauma on the center, like portion of the upper beak, and he was just really, really weak. This guy was so lethargic um, compared to the others. Um, he, he sadly, um, uh, we did start supportive care with him, but he sadly did pass away the following day. He was uh, getting the, um, he got testing done for a high path influenza and did come up positive. He got all the other testing that all the other individuals did too. He had a very mild anemia that was noticed. Um, but by the time we got the blood work results back, he unfortunately had passed away. So he got the general supportive care everybody else did. I will say at that level of being anemic because it was only 40% anemia. So just a little tiny decrease in his red blood cells. Um, he really would have just continued the same supportive care. Um, and he was sent out uh, for testing to the necropsy lab. And he was, again, positive through their testing too. All right. So case number eight, this is the last one to come in. She came in a little later. You can see she came in April 20th compared to everybody else who's coming in, you know, um, more like in the early uh, early month of April. She was uh, thin body condition. Um, and I see, I just like cut something off there. How silly of me. Um, but she was just, she was thin body condition. We swabbed her, um, and found that she was negative, but on her serology, uh, testing later on, she was positive. So when she came in, she was suspected to be negative on entry and she was thin, but she really was kind of okay in other ways. So she actually didn't get any treatments because we actually thought that she was more, um, of a, like, uh, casualty of avian influenza, not in the sense of getting the virus, but in the sense of a lot of these birds up there, um, they do, the biologists do uh, feed some of them. So they like, will put food out and the birds have the option to come and feed through getting that supplemental feeding from the biologist or, you know, finding whatever it is that they find out in the wild on their own. And um, she was one that was known to like frequent the, um, area where the supplemental feeding was. And so we thought that, well, they had stopped supplemental feeding because they didn't want these birds to congregate and pass the virus around, you know? So they really, they really were 
on top of it very quickly um, and stop doing that supplemental feeding to kind of make the birds disperse more and go find food on their own so that they wouldn't be sneezing on each other and stepping in each other's feces and potentially ingesting things and making the uh, outbreak a whole lot worse. So we thought that she was thin because she just wasn't getting as much food and maybe not as successful. Uh, but when she did come up positive on her titers for serology sample, that lets us know that actually she was positive at some point. She did get the virus, um, but by the time she got into, you know, she was uh, captured and able to get to the facility for testing, she was already negative for it. Um, she did have that same additional testing as everybody else, um, but again, she didn't do any treatments because um, she was kind of doing okay. Okay, so kind of an overview of um, the cases. There was a total of 21 deceased condors. Uh, 17 were deceased and recovered, but four were deceased and unrecovered. Um, they were able to uh, test uh, 19 um, of those, 19 came up as positive. There were two that were negative. Um, one was case one that the serology was positive and the other was case uh, eight that also had the positive serology. So even though they came up negative on their testing, we know because of their serology testing, their antibody levels that they were positive. Um, so just some basic statistics of what we dealt with at Liberty Wildlife. Um, eight out of the nine condors that we dealt with at Liberty Wildlife, um, starting March 17th up until current, uh, had high pathogenic avian influenza. Um, of those, four died and four survived. So we had a 50-50 um, survival versus death rate, which is sad. Of course, we want them to survive. We want them all to survive. That being said, I know some other rehab facilities that when dealing with this virus in raptors, um, had a greater than 99% death rate. So um, is that the is it that the condors maybe don't have as much of a problem with high pathogenic influenza as some other raptor species do? Um, is it that we were able to get them supportive care that got them through it? Hard to say, we don't really know, um, but we had about 50% that survived. Um, just some information on the medication that we use, the Tamiflu, since that was the most specific thing that's made for dealing with influenza. Um, well, the statistics on that are a little confusing as well because only four out of eight got the Tamiflu. Um, and of those that got it, we did do different dosages, but essentially, um, two survived that got it and two died. So we still had 50-50 statistics there. Um, I have just some information there about the signs and the duration of uh, how long it was a problem, but we're getting kind of close to the end as far as time goes. And I just want to hit on a couple other things. So I'm going to skip over. Um, now, sort of up to where, where are we at at this point? There's a lot that's gone into um, these cases. Although it was uh, eight cases of California condors with influenza that were at Liberty Wildlife, and there were 21 total, you know, in Arizona that were dealing with this problem, it really actually um, caused a lot of discussion nationally. Um, you know, the California condor is an endangered species, and we don't want to see the California condor go extinct, right? So um, there's a lot of people that rallied together and, you know, spoke to the USDA APHIS, um, authorities, and they went ahead and authorized the use of H5N1 vaccine in California condors. And I know that may not seem like too much because, hey, it's a vaccine, why can't we use it? But the, uh, the fact that the USDA authorized this vaccine to be used is huge. Um, when we use this particular vaccine in the U.S., it does actually affect our trade with other countries because um, at this point, we're no longer, you know, really functioning as a country that can say we are free of H5N1. Um, and that that really does affect how the poultry industry um, works essentially worldwide. So, so the fact that the USDA allowed us to, to do this vaccine is, is really quite amazing. Um, so they started off with doing some vaccine trials in vultures, and they had 20 vultures, um, and they divided up into a couple different groups and how they did the vaccine trials. Um, some just got um, uh, one vaccine, whereas others got two vaccines. So they got like a booster three, three weeks apart, uh, whereas one just got, or one group got 
uh, just a single vaccine, and then they're monitoring what their antibody responses are. And so we're still getting information from that, but so far the birds from those studies are doing great. We've actually gone on to um, do it in California condors now too. Um, so there aren't a ton of California condors that have been vaccinated to date, but it honestly just started um, in the last couple of weeks. So this is an evolving thing. Now the question is, is what's going to happen with the wild California condors? Are we going to be able to vaccinate these birds? And the thought is maybe we'll be able to do it opportunistically, but there's still a lot of discussion as to uh, with you know how we are going to be able to do that, when we're going to be able to do that. Um, so there's still more to learn. Now, the little bit of light at the end of the tunnel here. Um, just a fun little story that I'm, I'm sure some of you guys have heard at this stage. So with case number two, the individual who came in, who was with us for eight days, who um, really was a fighter as far as, as um, patients go, you know, and by that, I mean, she was a strong bird. She was, she was really um, seemingly trying to, to survive, you know, um, and she, we had found out after she had passed, her mate was still out there at the canyon. Um, and he was still hanging out at his nesting site. Um, and the biologists were watching him. He wasn't leaving the nesting site. And so they presumed that there must have been an egg in, in that nesting area that he was trying to be the father for, you know, his mate wasn't coming back. He was trying to care for this egg. Um, and so the biologist made the decision to go ahead and take that egg because if, you know, we, we knew we lost the mother and with the father being a really good father and not leaving that egg, uh, nobody wanted to lose him or have him, you know, be in contact with viral particles in the cave where the egg was and him come down with influenza. Um, and then we lose him and then also lose this possible baby. So the biologist made the decision to let's go in and let's get that egg out of there. Um, and give really more of the father a chance at survival is what everybody's thought was. Um, but they sent the egg down to Liberty Wildlife, hoping to, you know, that maybe, maybe this egg was viable, but nobody really knew. So Liberty Wildlife uh, housed the egg, took very, very good care of this little egg. Um, she came in to the facility, the egg, uh, came into the facility on the 17th of April. The egg was swabbed to make sure that it wasn't uh, positive for influenza. Um, and then after a stay there, the egg actually picked on May 8th, and then uh, we assist hatched it on May 9th. And so you can see the pictures there uh, where I'm in that upper right-hand corner, and I've actually got some little hemostats, and I'm helping the baby come out of the egg. So it was a real amazing experience. Um, the little hatchling stayed uh, with us for a little while. Um, she had to be swabbed for hypothogenic influenza. We swabbed her within 10 minutes of her hatching out of that egg. Uh, it came back negative, and then we got her transferred up to the World Center for Birds of Prey, and we got her transferred up there as quickly as we could, which was May 16th. So she hatched on the 9th. She was with us till the 16th, um, and it may seem like a large amount of time in between, and, and I will tell you that, you know, we felt like it was a large amount of time in between because we really wanted to get her to the World Center for Birds of Prey because that's where they do a lot of breeding of California condors, and we wanted to get her to a surrogate uh, parent. Um, but when you're moving a endangered species across state lines during a high pathogenic avian influenza outbreak, um, there's a lot of government officials that need to be involved. Um, this isn't something where we can just simply take this bird somewhere uh, at our free will. Um, so we did have to have a bit of time before we could actually get her transferred up there um, because of all the like legalities of, of transferring this endangered species during an outbreak. But we got her up there um, and she was paired with uh, two surrogate parents, and she's doing great. And the last pictures that I saw of her, she has ballooned into this gigantic fluff ball. Um, she's a tiny fluff ball in this image here, but uh, she is currently quite large. And so I'm, I'm anxious to get more updates as things go along with her. And then just a little bit more good news that happened this weekend um, on August 5th three of the sick condors that we treated. So of those eight cases that we 
had that four of them survived, three of them actually got to go back up um, to be released. So that's really awesome. One of them is just having to go through some molting um, before he's really in like good condition to be able to be released appropriately. So um, that is my talk for you guys. So there's some references. I can go ahead and uh, stop sharing my screen at this point. And I know I took us kind of right up to the end, but does anybody have any questions? Let me pull up the chat here. Um, it says, when you identify birds in the wild with HPAI, is it extrapolated to the general population to guess how affected the entire population is? Um, well, I mean, at this point, it's just sort of for the wild birds re reported. Um, it is a little hard to extrapolate, you know. Um, it also depends a little bit on the, the species we're talking about. So there's going to be more testing well currently there is there has been testing going on um in other states uh with different species of wild birds trying to get an idea doing the serology tests like we did where we're testing the antibody levels um in other species to see like how many birds actually out there are affected by this so i know that some of that test is testing is going on currently. So we'll definitely have more information in like the coming years of how this has really affected wild birds. Um, let's see. A uh, question, is there any information on if female birds may be more susceptible? Um, you know, it's we don't really know yet. There's been some hypotheses that there may be a little difference between the sexes that um, like in the condor specifically, there's been some thought that maybe the females are a little bit more susceptible, um, but we don't we don't know yet, you know, and also with such a small population um, of individuals, sometimes it's hard to make some of those inferences because, uh, you know, we, we need more numbers. So difficult to say. So did you did you address the uh, question about how did you uh, it looked like they were housed together? Um, oh, let's see, I, I missed that one. Thank you for I think that. Were I think those were just well, those okay. Were... How were we able to house these birds? Okay, so in the quarantine area, um, there was there was a room that was a quarantine room, and it had like we had set it up such that. Uh, when you walked into the quarantine room, there was like an extra space. You changed into appropriate um, uh, gowning and everything like that to maintain um, safety for yourself and safety for the birds. And then we walked further on into the room. And in that room, when the birds were sick, they were housed in individual cages. So like nobody was housed together in a cage, but there were individuals in multiple individuals in the room um, or had the potential to be multiple individuals in the room at a time. It, based on how they were coming in, there was a little bit of staggering that happened. Um, but when there was more than one individual in the room, they were in different cages and we tried to have them like at least having a cage apart so that there was space between them. Once they were tested negative and they got their two negative tests um, so that we could feel more confident that yes, this bird is truly negative, we, they got moved to like a like interim holding center. They sat in that like bank of cages for a period of time, made sure they were okay. And then they got uh, moved to like the general population um, with other condors, but they still stayed at a part of the facility where they were pretty much away from everybody else. Just again, trying our best to um keep them secured from any 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 other problems or any other birds that may be coming in that may be asymptomatic and and able to spread things so i have a question for you dr lamb uh do you think that this uh this virus will pop up again once it gets cool that's the worry i mean honestly yes that's what we're, we're really thinking is likely to happen um, so, you know, only time will tell, but that's what we do think is probably going to occur. Um, and then I see another part of that question is they had asked the photos look like the birds were kept together. So I will tell you, um, that the majority of the photos that are of condors, uh, except for, um, 
just a couple, are all uh, pictures that I took from the internet. And the reason I did that is because um, the patients that I work with, I still have to maintain their privacy, just like an individual would have to maintain the privacy of a human. Um, so all those pictures are pictures you can find on the internet. So it looks like they're together because they are, but they weren't in the facility. Those are just some other random birds. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, let's see. Is there a risk to feed birds at a feeder? Sure, I will say, I mean, there is a risk to feed birds at a feeder, but it's not just for influenza. There's other things that can be transmitted at feeders too. Um, we don't know how many small birds that come to feeders really are carrying the virus. Um, and again, like I said, there's lots of different types of influenza too. So absolutely there could be a bird that has one of the lower pathogenicity influenzas that it transmits to somebody else. Um, so I don't want to discourage people from using feeders. I mean, I have bird feeders too. I like to do it, but I, I, you know, I think it's good to clean the feeders, um, and maybe put them out at certain periods of time. Um, so, and then is the outbreak on the downswing yet? I mean, we're sort of on a downswing right now. Uh, but again, sort of time will tell as to whether or not this is something that's going to continue to, to be a problem. Once we, uh, have more moisture uh, in the environment. Once we get lower in temperatures again, it's very likely that this is going to be something that we're going to have to deal with again. Um, what measures were taken at Liberty to prevent the spread to the rest of the birds? Uh, really, the birds going into quarantine. So, and if there were other species of birds that came in that were suspicious in any way, they also went into a quarantine area, but a different quarantine area. There was quarantine for the condor specifically because they're an endangered species. So they were getting their own special quarantine area, but then there's also quarantine for all the other birds that are coming in too, um, if anybody was suspicious for influenza. Okay, does that look like it's it? Well, thank you so much. You've been really busy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate all you and everybody else does at Liberty Wildlife. It's a wonderful facility and we are so, we are so grateful that you exist, uh, that uh, people can take injured animals there.